Good morning and, and welcome. On behalf of the Governance Institute for Democratic Governance, our patrons and our partners, it is my honor and with great enthusiasm that I welcome all of you to the first Human Rights and Business Training Session. In the next two days, we will consider and reconsider the following challenge. How do we provide justice when a multinational company violates human rights? One thing we want to make clear is that this is not a, theoret a theoretical debate for policymakers. It is a real problem in which each one of us has a stake and a responsibility. Today we will look at six different but real cases, some involving Spanish multinational companies, some involving human rights violations in the European Union, others in Asia, South America, and Africa, some in which justice was delayed or denied, others which implemented alternative forms of justice. The violation of rights are as diverse as the cases themselves. Environmental damage, child labor, substandard and unsafe working conditions, corruption, injury, and death. To accompany our case study analysis, we will hear perspectives from experts with frontline experiences. Tomorrow we will consider the obligations and responsibility of corporations. We'll analyze and debate the role of business in society. We'll consider the effectiveness and the appropriateness of non-judicial remedies in cases concerning human rights violations, such as international arbitration and other forms of alternative dispute resolution. Finally, we will consider the role of civil society, of each one of us, to promote and to protect the human rights of all. And when those rights are violated, to consider what can be done, when and how. To end the sessions, we will engage our panelists and participants in an open and participatory format for a dynamic interchange of ideas, and hopefully and ideally to inspire a continued dialogue for the months and years ahead. To engage in this plenary discussion and issue analysis, we have with us a diverse group of speakers and panelists, as diverse as our participants seated before us now. We have with us international and national judges, CEOs, lawyers, professors, business representatives, international arbitrators, and NGO directors. I would also like to specially welcome everyone watching live via streaming over the course of the next two days, all the way from New York City to Brussels to Lagos, Nigeria. We invite you to participate in our discussion for all of our, our participants, those both present and joining us virtually, please send us your comments and your questions via Twitter at hashtag humanbusinesseu, and we would like to incorporate those comments and questions into our training sessions. And importantly, I would like to thank our patrons, uh, who without you, we wouldn't be here today, the European Commission, the San Telmo Museum, and the European Capital of Culture 2016, Donostia San Sebastian. We'd also like to thank our research partners who have joined us across six EU member states, the University of Navarra, the Frank Bold Society, the University of Castilla-La Mancha, the University of Yaume Uno, University of Rovira y Vigili, uh, Case Van Dam Consultancy, Ludwig Boltzmann Institute of Human Rights, Tilburg University, Utrecht University, Leiden University, the Public University of Navarra, the Law Offices of Cuatre Casas Gonzalez Pereira, uh, Adegui, KeyMap University, Humboldt University, the University of Deusto, and the University of the Basque Country. So as you can see, we have a diverse and a talented group of researchers, but research and policy is only one step and one aspect of our work. What we are doing today goes beyond the page. It involves raising consciousness and interchanging ideas between knowledge creators and knowledge users. So thank you for being here. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker. Antonio Vitorino, beyond being an extremely likable and knowledgeable person, has quite uh, the professional experience of which we are lucky and honored to draw upon today. Uh, a lawyer by profession, uh, uh, Antonio Vitorino has been associate at the law firm of Cuatre Casas Gonzalez in Pereira, also one of our researchers in our project. Uh, 
a Member of Parliament uh, for a number of years. He was Minister of Parliamentary Affairs in the Government of Mareo Saures, then Deputy Secretary of Administration and Justice for the Government of Macau. He was a judge on Portugal's Constitutional Court. He was elected Member of the European Parliament in 1994, then Chair of the Committee on Civil Liberties and Internal Affairs of the European Parliament. In 1995, he became Deputy Prime Minister and Defense Minister of Portugal. In 1999, he was appointed the European Commissioner for Justice and Internal Affairs, a post that he occupied until 2004. As a representative of the European Commission, he took part in the convention which drew up the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights and the Convention of the Future of Europe. He also participated in the Intergovernmental Conference which adopted the treaty establishing a constitution for Europe. I could go on, uh, but I think it's quite clear uh, that he has many interesting things to tell us today. And Antonio Viterino, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Well, good morning to all of you. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Governors Institute for the invitation. I'm supposed to give you a brief overview on fundamental rights in the European Union. My departing point is to say that in the original treaties, there was no such thing as a Bill of Rights. But that does not mean that there were no fundamental rights enshrined in different uh, rules of the Treaty of Rome and the Treaty of uh, the uh, European uh, Atomic uh, Energy. The reality is that when we talk about fundamental rights in the European Union for four decades, almost four decades, the building up of a legal framework based on fundamental rights was above all the work of the European Court of Justice. It's a jurisprudential origin uh, for fundamental rights in the EU legal uh, framework. But as you can imagine, since a very early stage of the European integration process, there was a huge debate whether the, uh, fund the treaties should incorporate a fully-fledged uh, Bill of Rights. It will be difficult to understand that uh, being the Union or the communities at that time, being an association, of democratic member states, each one of them with its own constitution, with its own Bill of Rights. It would be difficult to understand that the treaties that have a constitutional role in the European Union would not have a parallel instrument, a codification of the fundamental rights of the European integration uh, process. And, of course, there were voices saying that uh, such a move was fundamental to consolidate the constitutional concept of the role of the founding uh, treaties. I believe that uh, a big push forward in this debate occurred in the 80s, when two relevant constitutional courts of the member states, the German Constitutional Court and the Italian Constitutional Court, raised the issue of knowing if indeed the protection of fundamental rights in the European community law was uh, at the level of protection deserved to fundamental rights by the German and the Italian constitution. In fact, the debate was based on the principle that the European Court of Justice had stated that the EU law should have primacy. Primacy is, of, of course, a quintessential element of the very nature of the EU legal order. But if the EU law has a primacy over national law, it will be difficult to accept and understand that the degree of protection of fundamental rights deserved by the EU legal order will be less exigent, less requiring that the, protect, the degree of protection by uh, national uh, constitutions. I believe that the conflict in the 80s between the ECJ and the, these two constitutional courts was uh, a ceasefire. Uh, though both courts considered that in the overall, the protection of fundamental rights at EU level was equivalent to the protection deserved by national constitutions. But, and there is a very important but, of course, uh, there was a push also in the sense that uh, 
there should be some move at the European level to clarify the legal status of fundamental rights in the overall EU legal order. And I consider that there, are, uh, there is an element relevant in the aftermath of this debate in the late 80s when uh, the Council of Ministers of Social Affairs adopted the, the, what we in the European jargon call the Social Charter, which has got a different name, it is the Charter, European Charter on Fundamental Social Rights of the Workers, in the late 80s, 89, under the proposal of the European Commission, and then chaired by Jacques Delors, the Council of Ministers of Social Affairs adopted the Social Charter. The Social Charter is a very interesting text, which is often forgotten. Nobody almost refers to it, but it is the first attempt to codify at EU level a set of fundamental rights, basically economic rights and social rights, and it was presented by the European Commission as the so-called social dimension of the internal market. In the sense that the basics of the internal market was, of course, the liberalization of the markets, the four freedoms, freedom of um, goods, of uh, services, of uh, capital, and of uh, movement of people. And there was a need to compensate such a liberalization of the markets through the adoption of a set of uh, fundamental rights of the uh, workers. At that time, 89, the charter was adopted by 11 out of the 12 member states. There was one member state who did not subscribe to the charter. It's not difficult to guess which member state I'm referring to. It's the usual suspect. Uh, as you might guess, it was the United Kingdom who did not subscribe to the uh, social charter. The key issue of the social charter is that being the first attempt to have a codification of fundamental rights, it was not primary law. I mean, it was not enshrined in the treaties. It could not be considered of a substantial constitutional uh, nature. But the second moment after the debate in the 80s was undoubtedly the Maastricht Treaty. The Maastricht Treaty that, uh, of 92 that created the European Union was, I believe, a quintessential moment for the debate on the future of fundamental rights in the, at the European Union level. On one side, because the Maastricht Treaty incorporated the concept of European citizenship. By the way, uh, under the proposal of the then Spanish government, who was very adamant of having a set of rules on um, the European citizenship. And the concept of European citizenship has been translated into the treaties on a set of political rights, which are basically fundamental rights of the European citizens. Above all, the right to vote for the European Parliament, the right to uh, present uh, campaigns uh, to the European uh, 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 Ombudsman. So on one side, you have the European citizenship with a set of political rights enshrined in the treaty has primary law. And on the other side, the solution that was found was that uh, in Article 6, the fundamental rights of the European Union should be interpreted as uh, principles of uh, uh, community law in the light of the so-called common constitutional tradition of member states on, the other, on one side, and on the other side on the European Convention of Human Rights. What does this mean? This means that at Maastricht, the compromise on fundamental rights was, on one side, to bring to the European level what is called the common constitutional tradition of member states in what respects fundamental rights, Please don't ask me what this means. Uh, common constitutional tradition, which was a sufficiently ambiguous concept to incorporate different interpretations. And on the other side, a specific reference to the European Convention of uh, Human Rights, saying that the convention should be considered as a fundamental principle of community law. So not a text 
to refer to directly in the sense that uh, the communities or the union should accede to the European Convention of Human Rights, but in the sense that uh, the content of the European Convention of Human Rights should be taken into consideration as a guideline to the interpretation of the fundamental rights in the EU legal order. And in fact, this compromise solution corresponds to the existence of two camps in the European Union as far as fundamental rights is concerned. One camp was the federalist camp, clearly, saying there is no fully fledged material constitution at EU level if we do not have a Bill of Rights. So we need a Bill of Rights at EU level. It's the constitutional approach. The Federalists um, kept insisting that it was absolutely necessary to include in the treaties a fully fledged set of fundamental rights. But on the other side, a number of member states considered that uh, being reluctant to the Federalist concept being much more closer to the idea of the intergovernmental cooperation, they favored a different solution, an alternative solution, having the European Union acceding to the European Convention of Human Rights. I mean, having the European Union has, in parallel to the member states, to become one party in the European Convention on Human Rights. And at those times, beginning of the 90s, uh, the intergovernmental approach prevailed. And the Council of Ministers asked the European Court of Justice if the, it was possible for the Union to accede to the European Convention of Human Rights. And in 1996, the European Court of Justice made it clear that for the European Union to be party to the European Convention of Human Rights, it was necessary to have in the treaties as primary law a specific habilitation clause. So it was not enough, the reference to the European Convention of Human Rights as a fundamental principle of community law to allow the Union to require a formal accession to the European Convention of Human Rights. So the decision of the European Court of Justice was clearly a setback to those who uh, had a more intergovernmental approach. When you have a setback of, from one camp, you can expect a push forward from the other camp, definitely. And the Federalists came in 1999 with the idea that the moment is there to draft a Bill of Rights specific to the European Union legal order. And in fact, during German presidency in 1999, the European Council of Essen decided to create a body. Don't uh, ask me what this means, a body, an entity that would be in charge of drafting a charter of fundamental rights. But as, in, as it is very common in the European Union, it was a very ambiguous compromise. Because nobody said at that time if such a charter would be legally binding or non-legally binding. It was a charter. It was a sort of a pure academic exercise. And then when the body started meeting, under the chairmanship of a former colleague of mine, uh, the former president of the German Constitutional Court, Roman Herzog, uh, well, the body took its destiny on its own ends. Sometimes these things happen with uh, uh, institutions in the European Union. The body started by calling itself convention. And they started work, I was a member of the convention, so I'm to be blamed too. We started to draft a charter that uh, was done in a way with a clear vocation of becoming legally binding. So it was based on articles, it was drafted on a pure juridical approach, and it had even a set of final articles, very complex ones, by the way, that uh, will define the relationship between a legally binding Bill of Rights of the European Union with the European Convention of Human Rights, of which all member states were parties, by the way, and with the national legal order. At the end of this exercise, in 2000, the work done by the Convention was presented to the heads of state and government of the European Union. By the way, very nearby in the Biarritz 
uh, European Council of uh, 2000 and the French presidency. And the, the work was there. It was aimed to become legally binding, but of course the split among member states prevailed. The UK opposed with a very strong argument. We have just joined the European Convention of Human Rights. Two fundamental rights shocks are a little bit too much for uh, the British uh, taste. And of course the, uh, the opposition, the British were not isolated. The British were supported by the Nordic countries, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, and by the Netherlands, who had traditionally been in the intergovernmental camp and were not very adamant of the federalist move towards a fully fledged Bill of Rights enshrined in the EU uh, treaty. Therefore, the conclusion was that the Charter would not be legally binding. It would be a pure political declaration. But if you see the Charter, if you read the Charter of Fundamental Rights, you will see two main features. First, it is the most updated attempt to codify a set of fundamental rights as they stand today after the evolution of the Declaration of uh, Human Rights uh, of 48 and after the European Convention of Human Rights of the 60s in the Council of Europe and the several other legal instruments like the UN Civic Pact, the UN Political Pact and so on. So it is an attempt of uh, a synthesis of the state of the art of fundamental rights. And it is divided into uh, three, four major key elements. First, civil rights, as we know them, and to a large extent, the Charter of Fundamental Rights in this aspect, overlaps with the European Convention of Human Rights. Second building block, economic, social, and cultural rights. And this is extremely important for business, because usually business just look at secondary law at European level, they forget that the secondary level of legislation is submitted to the primary law, and the charter today is primarily primary law. I will come back to that point. So you have a set of economic rights, social rights, and cultural rights. And then you have the rights of the third generation, or fourth generation, now I'm a little bit lost to be honest, you have the right to open administration, for instance, but you have also room, rules on data protection, and data protection are going to be very much in the first page of the European debate in the months to come. And they are extremely relevant for business. I can guarantee you, if I, wanted, I was in the business side, I would look very carefully to the rules on data protection that are enshrined in the, fundamental, in the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union and in the secondary legislation and the preparation on data protection and things like, for instance, uh, genetic manipulation or uh, the use of uh, genetic material. Those are the rights of the third or of the fourth uh, uh, generation. But why am I talking about this if at the, at the end the decision of Pierre Ritz was that the Charter would just be a political declaration. Well, because life is more uh, dynamic than uh, sometimes uh, we expect. First and foremost, after the adoption of the political declaration, both the European Parliament and the Commission decided that they should be legally binded by the Charter. Even if the Charter was not legally binding, in practical terms, in the adoption of the legislation, both legislators, Commission and uh, Parliament, would feel compelled to check the conformity of the secondary legislation they were adopting in relation to the political declaration, Charter of uh, Fundamental Rights. And then, during these last years, between 2000 and 2007, several courts started referring to the Charter. And to your surprise, it was not the European Court of Justice. National constitutional courts start taking decisions referring to the Charter of Fundamental Rights. The Italian constitutional court was the first one, the Spanish constitutional court, some superior courts in the member states starting in their statements making reference to the articles of the Charter of uh, Fundamental Rights. And last but not least, 
the advocate generals in the European Court of Justice started including in their arguments references to the Charter. That they were not taken on board afterwards by the ECJ, which is a very careful uh, institution, but in practical terms, the argument was there, and the argument was referred to the articles of the Charter of, uh, fundamental, of fundamental Rights. Then we arrive to 2003. In 2003, the Convention on the Future of Europe decided to adopt an European constitution, as you know, and the first chapter would be the Charter of Fundamental Rights, the Bill of Rights. So here we go back to our good old constitutional tradition. If we have a constitution, we need a Bill of Rights, and the Bill of Rights is the opening chap charter of uh, uh, a constitution. But to give some leverage to the intergovernmental camp, the Convention on the Future of Europe included a, a, a rule saying that at the same time, the Union was habilitated to require access to the European Convention of Human Rights. So, as usual, at the European level, we try to reconcile the best parts of two worlds. One Bill of Rights, but at the same time, paved the way for accession to the European Convention on Human Rights. As you know, the Constitution died in the shores of France and Netherlands in, the, in 2005. And then with the Lisbon Treaty, the Charter was reconvened as a protocol of the Treaty of the European Union. Well, as a protocol, it is clearly primary law. So there is no doubt that protocols have the same legal ranking as the treaties themselves. So since the 1st of December 2009, the Charter of, of Fundamental Rights is constitutional law of the European Union. It is a parameter for uh, evaluating the legality of all secondary legislation at the EU level. And as far as the European Convention of Human Rights, there is a huge difference, huge difference, between what had been decided in the Convention on the Future of Europe and what is now legal, legally binding by the Lisbon Treaty. It no, it, it's no longer an habilitation to accede to the European Convention. It's a legal obligation. So making it clear. The treaty says that the European Union shall have to accede to the European Convention of Human Rights. So to a certain extent, in the Lisbon Treaty, the intergovernmental camp got a compensation by an upgrading of the connection with the European Convention of Human Rights. It's no longer an habilitation clause, it's a legal obligation. That's why I would say for the last three and a half years, there has been a very uh, cumbersome, complex negotiation between the European Commission and the Council of Europe in order to uh, make it possible for the European Union to accede to the European Convention of Human Rights. It's a very complex issue, because as you can imagine, the Council of Europe is composed of, if my memory does not fail me, 47 member states, of which, of course, 28 are members of the European Union, so they are on two sides of the, of the table. But of course, you need to persuade the other 19 that the European Convention should include as a party one international organization, the European Union, of which are members, countries that are already parties to the European Convention on Human Rights. And after three and a half years of negotiation, there is a mandate. And there was a mandate and there is an agreement between the European Commission and the Council of Europe on allowing the Union to become party in the European Convention of Human Rights. In fact, in December last year, this agreement was submitted to the overview of the European Court of Justice. 
and the European Court of Justice in an opinion adopted in December, in the, on the 18th of December 2014, decided to reject, reject the uh, accession agreement of the European Union to the European Convention of Human Rights. On three basic grounds. The first one is that the European Court of Justice considers that the terms of accession do not preserve the autonomy of the EU law in relation to the international public uh, law that is the European Convention of Human Rights. So uh, for the European Court of Justice, the terms of the accession violate Protocol 8, Annex to the Lisbon Treaty, that states that the accession cannot uh, undermine the autonomy of the uh, European Union uh, law. The second argument is a marginal one. It's a rather complex one. It's an interesting one. It's about the scope of judicial review on uh, decisions and actions taken by the European Union under common foreign and security policy. It's an interesting debate. I think that it should be studied more in depth, and it is a challenge for those who are in search of a subject for a, a PhD. Uh, in fact, if you look to the uh, Treaty of the European Union, you will see that uh, the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice on issues referring to common foreign security policy is very limited. Is very limited. Is very much restricted. If you compare the scope of judicial review on CFSP, on common foreign security policy at EU level, with the capacity of some national courts to overview, to judicial review on foreign policy of national member states, you will see that the scope of the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice is much more limited than the scope of judicial re review at national level. It is true that in some other member states, courts are very much prevented from interfering with foreign policy. So you have very different cultures when it comes to judicial review in foreign policy, and the compromise solution that was adopted in the European Union treaties is a halfway or three quarter, quarters way in between the different cultures among the member states. The point being, the point being that in the interpretation of the European Court of Justice, the fact that we refer to the European Convention of Human Rights and the Union can accede to the European Convention of Human Rights, the European Convention of Human Rights will enlarge the scope of review, of judicial review on foreign policy. And therefore, the Court of Strasbourg, of the European Convention of Human Rights, will have a broader jurisdiction on foreign policy than the European Court of Justice, which is the dedicated court of the European Union. So the contradiction on foreign policy is one of the, one of the uh, arguments. But the key argument of the European Court of Justice is to say that one of the difficulties of the exercise of having the Union acceding to the European Convention of Human Rights is that uh, one needs to clarify if a complaint should be addressed to one member state or to the Union as such. It's a very interesting uh, subject from the legal point of view because you have directives, for instance, adopted at EU level that need to be translated into the national legislation through national rules. When there is a question concerning a fundamental right, one must clarify if the question that it is at stake refers to the national legislation that translated the directive, or if it is re related to the directive itself. And when clarifying who is to be blamed, let's go like this, the European uh, Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg will have to take a decision on the, uh, on the partition of competences, on the share of competences between national level and the European level. And the European Court of Justice considers that such a judgment by the, by the Court of Strasbourg 
is illegitimate in light of the European Union legislation. It would bind the European institutions to a criteria of uh, uh, share of competencies adopted elsewhere, outside the European Union framework, and that would violate the autonomy of the uh, European law. So, coming to this conclusion, and I'm concluding now, the Court of Justice decided to block the accession of the European Union to the European Convention of Human Rights. So, what's going to happen next? It's very easy. Everybody goes back to the drawing board, and reopen the negotiations between the European Commission and the Council of Europe. It took three and a half years last time. How long will it take now, I don't know. Nobody can know in advance. And in between, there is no emptiness, of course, because the charter is there. The charter of fundamental rights will be implemented by the European institutions, above all, by the European Court of Justice. Some people say that the decision taken by the European Court of Justice is precisely to create a sufficient backlog of jurisprudence on fundamental rights before the Court of Strasbourg is allowed to come in. But, well, probably it's just pure criticism. But I would say that for the years to come, to quote, uh, well, Usually in these conferences, one is supposed to quote uh, high personalities of the legal world. But if you allow me, I would prefer to quote Lucky Luck, the very famous fans in uh, Eero saying that uh, as far as fundamental rights is concerned, the European Court of Justice is going to be the lonesome cowboy in town. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, quite an interview, and I think you did very well with the time that was permitted. Uh, and, and what stands out listening is, is how much, even though you mentioned so many important legal instruments, what stands out the most is, and as you referred to quote you, the complex and cumbersome negotiation. And you know, as we set out and embark uh, as, as researchers or as practitioners to, to try and create some recommendations for policymakers, uh, is our work a question of law, or, or is this a game in politics? Well, I, I, I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint you, but um, we lawyers, and I am a constitutional lawyer, we believe that uh, there is no life uh, beyond the Constitution. But I'm afraid I need to give you the bad news that there is more life beyond the Constitution. In the sense, quod non es in Constitution, non es in mundo. No. Unfortunately, there is a lot of world beyond uh, the constitutional uh, framework, and it's the constitutional framework who needs to adapt. Probably it's, uh, it's, it's my personal problem. I've lived so much, so many times in the European institutions that I've learned that one needs to learn how to compromise to find solutions, solutions that are not always easy from the legal point of view. I mean, if you ask me what is rational, well, it is very easy to identify what is rational from, from the legal point of view. But then you need to cope with political commitments and political compromises. If you have two camps, one very much federalist oriented, saying we need a fully fledged, self-sufficient Bill of Rights. But on the other side, you have another camp who has also strong arguments, saying, listen, listen, listen. We are not developing a specific set of fundamental rights for the, quote, quote, elite countries of the European Union. We cannot separate ourselves from the entire other European countries who share a broader ground called European Convention of Human Rights. Mm -hmm. So we should not create an apartheid for the EU as far as fundamental rights is concerned. We should keep a link, a strong link, with all the other European countries, even those who have no vocation to join the European Union, such as, for instance, the Russian uh, Federation. And then what comes to the lawyer? Well, it comes to the lawyer to reconcile these two political positions. You can say, oh, for God's sake, forget that. It's so confusing. Two Bill of Rights instead of one. It's much easier to have one and then refer to it. Okay. That's fine. 
You, as a lawyer, you feel happy with your statement. Thank you so much. But then life comes in. <laughs> and when life comes in, political life comes in, you need to understand that if you want to build political consensus on your own Bill of Rights, you, knew, you also need to give some ground for those who consider that the Union should be party in the European Convention of Human Rights. I don't hide to you that the difficulty lies in the fact that the solution that we need to find cannot translate into establishing a formal hierarchy between international courts. It's a very sensitive issue. I mean, you need to be sufficiently imaginative and contrary to the public opinion. Lawyers are by far the most imaginative people in the world, I can guarantee you. Um, <laughs> but in fact, you need to be sufficiently imaginative to find a coordination solution between the two legal systems and the two courts that does not lead to a formal statement on which one prevails? Which one is hierarchical superior to the, to the other? And that's what we, the Commission has tried to do in these negotiations for three and a half years. Apparently, the European Court of Justice is not satisfied with the solution, so we need to go back to the drawing board and trying to find new solutions to uh, guarantee a, a, a mechanism of coordination of the two courts. I, I don't hide to you for those who want to study, make the comparison between the chart of fundamental rights of the European Union and the European Convention of Human Rights, that there are a few cases where the content of the rules are not exactly the same. I mean, there has been a concern when drafting the chart of fundamental rights, and I, I, that I know very well, because I spent lots of hours of my life trying to make sure that we would not create uh, any um, gap between the concept of uh, key fundamental rights in the Charter and the concept of those corresponding key fundamental rights in the European Convention of Human Rights. But there are a few cases where the drafting of the articles have the potential for a conflict, or at least for different scopes of interpretation. I'll give you two examples, two examples. The first one is an example that does not deal with business. It's about the concept of family, family, what, which is a family and, and marriage. It's a key, it's, it's an issue of uh, family law. It does not uh, deal with business, but it is quite clear in my interpretation that the drafting of the article of the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Family and the draft of the, fundament, of the fundamental right of family in the European Convention of Human Rights do not coincide. Mm -hmm. The Charter is more, I don't know, I, mean, I do not want to use any uh, moral or <laughs> uh, uh, qualification, is more open than the concept of uh, the European Convention of Human Rights. Probably it is the difference between the 60s and the, 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 the 2000s, okay? But when it comes to the interpretation of the article, uh, there is a potential of differences there. There is a second article, which is, uh, well, uh, a little bit more tricky. It's about what the, the content of judicial review, in the sense that in the European Convention of Human Rights, it is possible to consider that there is sufficient judicial review, even when the review is not done by a fully-fledged court, but it's done by an, an administrative body with uh, independent characteristics. Mm -hmm. That's not the case in the European Union law. In the European Union law, and specifically in the article on judicial review in the Charter, uh, it is much more uh, exigent, uh, requiring on the very nature of the uh, very judicial nature of the reviewing body. So to a certain extent, things that can be considered in the light of the European Convention of Human Rights as being submitted to judicial review uh, should not pass the, 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 exam the criteria of the European Court of Justice and of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So I've just given you these two examples. There are a few more, but uh, I will spare you the others. But there are some areas where 
when interpreting the, con the, the core of a fundamental right, there is a potential conflict between the interpretation of the fundamental right in Strasbourg and the interpretation of the, that the same fundamental right in uh, Luxembourg, in spite of the fact that they are only 100 kilometers apart, one from the other. Thank you. We have time for, I believe, maybe two questions from the participants. Not all at once. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, many of the cases we'll consider over the coming two days involve um, human rights violations committed outside the European Union by companies that operate from the European Union. Hence my question, in via your view, to what extent and under what conditions um, does the EU Charter impose obligations on the EU or the member states to protect the people over there, so in Nigeria, Bangladesh, and so on, to protect these people and their human rights? So it's basically a question about the extraterritorial effect of the EU Charter. Thank you very much. Well, that's a time bomb. <laughs> the issue will come up. Uh, the issue, as far as I know, has never been addressed uh, in, the, in the scope of application of the Charter up to now. It's quite clear that when it comes to the territorial competence of the Member States and of the European Union courts, because, as you know, national courts are also EU courts, it's quite clear that the jurisdiction applies to uh, everybody irrespective of their nationality because only a limited number of fundamental rights in the Charter are specifically attributed to the EU citizens. Only a limited number. The vast majority of the fundamental rights that are enshrined in the Charter are applied to all persons, all persons which is uh, something that has not been fully explored up to now, but it will be in the sense that you don't need to be an European citizen, you don't need to be an European corporation to claim for the fundamental rights that are enshrined in the Charter when we, you are acting in the European Union and under the jurisdiction of the national member states and therefore the European courts, okay? When it comes to extraterritorial uh, <laughs> uh, competence, the approach that has been followed up to now is to make the union party in different international uh, legal instruments. For instance, uh, the European Convention Against Organized Crime including uh, smuggling of people and uh, smuggling of weapons. It's a UN convention. The member states are party to the convention, but the union is also party to the convention because some parts of the convention falls under the competence of the European Union. Are no longer in the member states, they are in the competence of the European uh, Union. And for instance, I was, co as a member of the European Commission, I had to sign partially <laughs> the UN Convention Against uh, Organized Crime because some of the competencies were represented by the Commission, but the other comp competencies were the exclusive of the member states. Confusing? Yes, definitely. <laughs> it's confusing, but that's the kind of share of competencies internally, which by the Photofrost uh, jurisprudence of the European Court of Justice says that all competencies that in the legal internal order of the Union are transferred to the European level can only be exercised at the European level. All the other competencies that are not transferred to the European Union are, be, be, remain in the member states. So if you have a comprehensive legal instrument that has competency, European competencies and national competencies, everybody needs to be there, including, of course, the European Union. The same applies to the A Convention, the, the, the participation of the Union in the A Convention. To a large extent, 
a number of legal instruments on civil international cooperation are now communitarized. Let's go like this. So it's the community who needs to be there, now the union that needs to be there. And therefore, there is the huge question of being, the union being party of the Hague Conventions, which is a complex issue. There are other international conventions on the same, in the same relations. When it comes to uh, human rights, as far as I know, well, I, I, I was defeated in the European Court of Justice when I was in the Commission on that specific point. So you, you, I, I'm suspicious to, to speak about that. But let me just very briefly tell you what happened. It's an interesting case because the UN uh, Security Council adopted the sanctions, the list of um, terrorist organizations and people suspected of terrorism whose assets uh, should be frozen, okay? And uh, that, if in my interpretation, that creates an international legal obligation for the member states. And at EU level, it was decided that the implementation of those lists should, should be done by the European uh, Union directly. And so the lists were adopted by the Council of Ministers with the names of the people who were suspected of terrorist activities and whose assets should be frozen. And there was a complaint against the regulation, the EU regulation, uh, in the European Court of Justice by two Swedish uh, citizens who had their assets frozen uh, because they considered that uh, there was no sufficient judicial review on the decision taken to froze the, those assets. And then we had a very interesting case where you have an international obligation created by UN Security Council, you have the implementation at European level, and you have a complaint that you don't have sufficient judicial review at EU level to guarantee the conformity of the decision taken by the uh, EU uh, Council. And the court considered that the complaints were right. There was no sufficient review at EU level because no court was entitled to review the decision of freezing those assets. But the problem that arises from that is that we were just accomplishing an international obligation. So uh, if we default in the implementation of the UN Security Council resolution, the member states or even the union itself, one know, does know, becomes legally responsible for not implementing um, a resolution of the UN Security Council. And so I, I conclude by giving you back the question. And which is the court that solves this, this problem? We have time for one more qu one more question. Thank you, Philip Gregor Frank Bolt. Uh, I would like to ask: To what extent may the EU Charter uh, justify the competence of the EU to ensure the enforcement of the rights enshrined in the in the in the EU Charter in the absence of secondary legislation? Okay, um, so we've got the EU Charter, and one may argue that uh, the rights, the rights uh, enshrined in this Charter cannot be properly enforced due to various barriers. And the question is whether this may justify the competence of the European Union to come with measures, with legislation, to improve the enforcement of these, of these, of these rights. Well, it was a very, conceptually speaking, it was a very interesting debate because in theoretical terms, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union should have a set of, fundament, of, of fundamental rights that already exist and are implemented at the EU level. Uh, so. The, the basic idea in 2000, when we drafted the Charter, 
was what the French say, a droit constant. So we should not innovate. We should just stick to the existing level of fundamental rights. So the question that you raise about enforcement, well, the, the enforcement capacity is there. If the fundamental rights were confined to the existing legislation, the enforcement should be developed normally through secondary legislation. The debate was a conceptual one saying, well, can we have a Bill of Rights that is silent about death penalty, for instance, about death penalty? Can we have a Bill of Rights in the year 2000 that does not state clearly what is the common understanding of all the EU member states of the illegitimacy of death penalty? And the answer was no. Nobody would understand. So there is an article that forbids um, death penalty. But you can ask me, well, is anyone at EU level thinking about <laughs> applying death penalty to the violation of EU law? Of course not. So the compromise solution in the Charter was to include a set of fundamental rights that go beyond the scope of the EU uh, legislation, but to a certain extent they represent a common culture on fundamental rights that could not be omitted in a Bill of Rights. It's the case of death penalty. It's the case also of family law. I mean, there is no single union concept of family. There is no legislation of the European Union saying which is a family, what is a family, who composes a family, how can you compose a family? But in fact, in fact, nobody could understand that there was no article on family, on the concept of family. Then you have other border cases which are more complex, like for instance, the article, which is a very interesting one, on genetics, genetic manipulation, genetic research. We tried to incorporate in the Charter what was enshrined in the Council of Europe Convention of Oviedo, okay? But we knew, we knew that not all member states, not all member states were party to the Convention of Oviedo. So, there was a compromise, there is an article on that, because we considered that in the future, most likely the Union will be confronted with questions dealing with man genetic manipulation and genetic research, and it is already dealing with that. The, the stem cells debate. What's the cells you can froze? Uh, how, how can you reuse the cells, the stem, stem, stem cells? Yes. I think uh, the cellule souche, uh, as the <laughs> French say, st stem cells. Stem cells. Stem cells. Stem cells. Uh, how can you use them? Uh, how can you for forbid the, the, the commerce, the trade with, of stem cells? All those elements are already there today in the debate, uh, in the European debate. There were no rules about that at EU level at all. And we created a specific article on that in the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So, I don't have a crystal clear answer to you in the sense that it was a compromise solution. Articles that uh, could not be omitted because they are party of our core cultural understanding of fundamental rights. Articles that are already there because there is already secondary legislation and so they should be codified. And some potential new areas where the existence of some fundamental rights in the Charter is important as a guideline for the uh, legislative development, like in data privacy, for instance, data protection, like uh, genetics uh, manipulation. So it's, it's, it's a mix, it's a mix. But I, I do believe that the institutions are in charge of uh, implementing the, the, the Charter, and there is a dimension of the Charter, and I conclude with this, that I believe it is important. We Europeans are very much criticized by other, by countries elsewhere in the world that we have the idea that we, are, we, we teach lessons on fundamental rights. We are the, the professors on fundamental rights. Uh, well, uh, we have some sins at home, we know that. But even more than that, I believe that in, in our foreign policy, having a chart of fundamental rights is, a, is an important instrument because it defines our, our European profile in the global uh, fundamental rights debate, human rights debate, 
whether it is in the UN, whether it is in, with other regional fora, and we must be prepared to be judged by the others about the way we ourselves implement our own fundamental rights. If, uh, uh, if we put our money, our lips, <laughs> our money, where are you? our lips, if we are uh, effective in respecting our own uh, principles. Thank you. I think we have a sort of, or, or is there a quick comment or question? Uh, we have a, a, a microphone. Thank you for the presentation. It was extremely stimulating, actually. Um, don't you think that um, apart from the conflict that we are, um, we are seeing now between the two courts, in a way, uh, who is the most important court, whether the Strasbourg or the Luxembourg court. But this is just, uh, uh, just a, a, a superficial approach, actually. Don't you see there is a sort of uh, new debate uh, like the debate that occurred in the past, and you refer to it, between the constitutional courts of some countries and the uh, court in Luxembourg. At the time, the states uh, um, alleged they had more protection of rights than the uh, community, and possibly it was the case at the time. Now, uh, the same debate goes between the Council of Europe and the EU. But uh, isn't the fact that the European Convention is old-fashioned and does not protect the rights enough? I mean, if we think that the, uh, consider that the European Convention does not have yet a civil right to equality. It's in a protocol, but it's not in force for the time being, which is a basic uh, principle in the European Union and not only in the European Union, but the, in the UN Bill of Rights. So uh, it's, uh, it's a bit, um, how can I say, uh, out of time to think of uh, uh, submitting the EU in a way to the Council of Europe, which has standards that are not at the level of the European Union. Absolutely. I fully agree with you. I don't see too much added value in the accession if you take into consideration the fact that there is already the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So if you ask me, is the protection of fundamental rights in the European Union going to be loser because you don't accede to the European Convention of Human Rights, my answer is no. No. Definitely not, because even the examples I could give you of uh, articles, fundamental rights, where do not coincide, usually, or, or I would say, in all cases, I know, the content of the article in the Charter is broader than the content of the So, the, in the European Convention, it's always a more limited scope, a less protective scope than the one that is in the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So you are absolutely right. From the substantial point of view, uh, the Charter is much more updated. The Charter tried to be, with, with problems and uh, imperfections, of course, but tried to be a synthesis of fundamental rights for the 21st century, at least in the beginning of the 21st century. And it's much more developed than a Charter that was drafted in the 60s, in the 50s, late 50s, in the 60s, and definitely, even with the protocols, uh, is outdated. The point is not, um, cannot just be seen from the perspective of the protection of fundamental rights. It's also a political point. Some people in the European Union, some member states, considered that uh, we should not create, allow an enlarging gap between the countries of the European Union and the countries of the Council of Europe when in what concerns uh, fundamental rights. And so keeping the union linked would be an incentive for the Council of Europe also to, to move ahead. Well, 
it's a limited uh, scope. I do, uh, the, the, the impact will be a limited one. But, you, you know, uh, in the European Union, you need to reconcile 28 different member states. And uh, if the price to pay to have a fully fledged Bill of Rights is to keep a link with the European Convention of Human Rights, it's cheap. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you for the questions also. As you can see, we're working within a European context, which is complex, legal, political, economic, uh, social, and lots of, lots of considerations in, in this wide context. And within that, what happens? How do we protect our, our multinational companies? And then also, how do we protect and promote the rights of human rights, not just for European citizens, but as you mentioned, rights that in theory are fundamental for all. How do we provide access to justice when our own companies maybe violate those rights uh, here and abroad? For the rest of the day today, we'll be looking at specific examples of when this happens and how we consider this uh, and, and what proposed solutions and challenges to consider. So we'll break until 11. Please enjoy the coffee break that's provided for you right around the corner. And we'll start back in about 20 minutes. Thank you.